It has been said that all's well that ends well, but who defines what is well? Case in point, I find out my wife is an unfaithful whore, throw her out and get rid of her. It all ends well for me, right? Then why am I so miserable? It started six months ago when I married my secretary. The day she showed up for her interview and walked into my office, my brains shot straight to my lower abdomen and he said, you're hired, before we even said hello to each other. She was a tall woman, 175 centimeters, and a body to die for, 915686, as I found out later. She had the face of an angel and long blonde hair that went down to the middle of her back. As she sat down in front of me and crossed her impossibly long legs, I had only one question I wanted to ask. When can you start? I asked other questions, such as how many words per minute she could type, how her shorthand was, and how familiar she was with the computer programs I mentioned. To this day, I don't even remember her answers to those questions, but they didn't matter because I wasn't going to let her get away with it, even if she couldn't do any of those things. Fortunately, she turned out to be an excellent typist, could take dictation, and was great on the computer. Nine months later, we were married, and after another six months, I started seeing and hearing things that made me believe Hillary wasn't so faithful to me. At first, it was what I didn't hear. Guys would stand around talking but would shut up when I approached, or they saw me approaching and the group would quickly disperse. One day, I walked into the men's restroom and caught the end of a conversation that immediately stopped when I entered. I only heard three words, it's freaking Hillary, before Ron and Bert saw me, zipped up and left. I started watching Hillary, but never saw anything out of the ordinary and wrote it off as my imagination playing out. It wasn't until I plugged into the conference room that I actually heard something definite. I had several subgroups working on different projects, and they were using the conference room for team meetings. I was tired of them coming to my office to get me into the conference room just to answer some idiotic question, so I decided to just set up an intercom system. If they needed my information, they could just call me and I could answer their questions without leaving my office. I installed the system and then ran a few tests to make sure it was working properly. The last check was from the room to my office, and it was working fine, but I forgot to turn it off when I left the room. I was sitting in my office sorting out some papers when Steve, Mike, Al, and Joe walked into the conference room. Mike asked where Bob was, and Joe laughed. Where do you think he is now? He's trying to get Hillary ready for Chuck leaving town tomorrow. You couldn't confuse who they were talking about with anyone else. I was the only Chuck working there. I actually owned the company. And I was the only one there with a wife named Hillary, and I was leaving town the next day for a two-day business trip. Why aren't you trying? Mike asked Joe. I tried, but she said she wanted to try something new. A few chuckles, and then Al said, That means I won't get anything for a while. I wonder if Chuck is getting anything, Mike said, and Al laughed again and asked, When is she going to squeeze him into her schedule? And they all laughed. Just then, Bob came into the room and asked what was so funny. We were just wondering if Chuck would ever get to have his wife. I don't know about Chuck, but I know exactly who is going to bury a bone in her tomorrow. You're your own dog, Al said. Get ready for some perversion, Steve interjected. Perversion? What do you mean, perversion? Yeah, she enjoys sleeping with you while she's on the phone with Chuck. What the fuck? Holy shit, man. You think Chuck knows? I know for a fact he doesn't. Hillary tells everyone she sleeps with to make damn sure they never do anything to get Chuck's attention. She says that if she even smells anything he might suspect, everyone will be cut off forever. You'll hear the speech tomorrow before she unzips your fly, and she means it. So you know if you screw up in front of all of us, we will hunt you down and cut off your ears. Right, guys? This was followed by all of them saying, hell yeah, or put your ass on the line. Then Mike said, Okay, guys, let's cut to the chase. What are we going to do about... And at that point, I turned off the intercom, took the tape out of the system recorder, and put it in my briefcase. One trait I don't have is stupidity. I didn't sit there and moan, oh, this can't be happening. She loves me. I just know she does. Denial is not part of my character. One guy, and it might just be wishful thinking, but when five guys are talking about what they've already done, you don't wring your hands and say there must have been some mistake. What hurt me the most was that those same five guys were supposed to be my good friends. 
We went fishing together, went on weekend trips to Vegas together, and played poker at my house every other Friday. Fucking friends. Then there was Hillary. What happened there? How did the blush come off the rose so quickly? Could it be that she only married me for my money? Marry the owner of a company and be wealthy for life? I didn't know and didn't want to find out. I would make sure it was true and then she wouldn't realize what hit her. The next evening, I called home from San Francisco at my usual time, and when Hillary picked up the phone, she sounded a little out of breath. I wasn't paying close attention to what she was saying because I was straining to see if I could hear background noise. I thought I heard heavy breathing, and I know I heard a squelching sound. Hillary and I chatted about nothing for a couple minutes, and each of us told the other what we liked and then hung up. I hoped Bob was enjoying life. It would be a shame to go through what was going to happen to him and not get anything out of it. When I got home, Hillary was waiting for me, dressed in my favorite outfit, a pair of sneaker shoes and nothing else. She asked me if I wanted something to drink or if I'd rather just go to bed soon. Hillary was a fantastic asshole and I was going to miss her, but I was being realistic and knew I shouldn't start missing her until she was really gone. So I threw my briefcase on the floor and started undressing. It was going to be a long night. As I was leaving for work the next morning, I thought again about how much I was going to miss her. The upcoming Friday was the usual night for our poker game. The reason for having the game at my house was simple, so that I wouldn't have a problem getting home. I can't stand alcohol. I like to drink, and I enjoy drinking. I have a good time when I get drunk to the point where I pass out. When that happens, I'm dead to the world and nothing can wake me up. It was always like that. We would meet at my house, play poker until I passed out, and then my friends would pick me up, lay me on the couch, finish dealing, and leave. At poker nights, Hillary, saying she hated being surrounded by a bunch of yelling men, would leave and go shopping or to the movies. Until a week ago, I had no reason to doubt that what she was saying was what she was actually doing, but now I wondered if she was doing any of those things. It was self-evident to me that if she took such pleasure in being had while talking to me on the phone, she would take even more pleasure in sleeping with them while I was right there in the room. On Thursday, while Hillary was at her hairdresser's appointment for the day, I went home, set up two remote control video cameras, and put the remotes under the seat cushions on the couch, then went back to work. Friday at 7 o'clock, the guys started arriving, and by 7.15, we were all sitting around the table ready to play. Hillary came into the room, kissed me, and told me she'd see me when I woke up in the morning, then left to go to the movies. It's going to be a great night, guys, I said. I could feel it in my gut. I broke the seal on a new deck of cards, and we placed our bets. I pulled out the ace of spades. Good omen, guys. Get your wallets out and get ready to contribute. House rules are the same as always. Three raises, no checks or raises, $5 limit, and dealer's choice. I announced a draw of five cards, jacks, or better to open the count, and dealt the cards. I picked up my cards, looked at them, and couldn't keep from smiling. I had three jacks and two unwanted cards. Al, to my left, was the first player to bet, and he passed. Mike passed and Steve opened the count for a dollar. Joe raised a dollar and Bob dropped his cards. I smiled and said, yes, indeed, man, this is my lucky night, and raised five bucks. Al threw his hands up and everyone else who was still in the room congratulated. Mike took one card, so I knew he was trying for a flush or a straight. Steve took three, so I knew he had an older pair. Opening should have been jacks or better, and I had three jacks, so he should have had queens, kings, or aces. Joe took two, which made him hard to read. He could have had a three of a kind, but it was known that he held a senior pair with an ace and then bluffed up a storm. I took two, and when I looked, I saw that I had thrown in two unnecessary cards just to make room for two more unnecessary cards. Mike made a check, Steve bet a dollar, and Joe made a call, which told me he didn't get any help for his high pair. I raised five bucks, Mike and Steve dropped their cards, and Joe made a call. I showed my three jacks, and Joe raised his hand with the words, damn. I collected the pot and snorted. My night partners, you don't have to play. Just give me your money. My usual drink was a vodka tonic with a slice of lime, and it looked like that's what I was drinking. But there was just water in my glass. 
I drank my water in a volley, and when the glass was almost empty, I stood up and asked the guys if they were ready to pour some more, and then I went and filled my glass with water and gave them back their drinks. I won one pot out of every four and was a real fun Charlie, as I drank my water and acted like I was pumped. It was three hours into the game, and in the middle of a losing hand, I performed my usual passing out routine. Al stood up and shook me awake, and I pretended to be dead. He's ready, Al said. Help me get him to the couch. Steve walked over to help him while Mike pulled out his cell phone and made a call. He's ready, he said to whoever was on the other end of the wire. Okay, babe, I'll see you in ten minutes. She's on her way, he said to the group. Let's finish the giveaway. Might even make it to two more before she gets here. Bob, who was playing with the band for the first time, asked what they were going to do with me. Nothing, Al said. He's what makes this thing work for us. I don't get it. Just wait, young Bob, and you'll be amazed. Ten minutes later, Hillary walked through the front door, and as it closed behind her, I reached under the pillows for the remote control that operated the camera that was set up to cover the room. Hillary threw one look at me and said, Damn it, guys. Why do we have to go through this every time? You know you have to sit him on the couch so it looks like he's watching. Steve and Bob came over and moved me over so it looked like I was sitting there watching. While I was being seated, Hillary undressed and said, spread the cards to see who goes first. Al drew the senior card and Hillary asked him, what do you want, love? Hillary walked around the table and through squinted eyes, I could see her leaning forward over the table to look at me while Al had sex with her. Then it started to happen again as they all took turns approaching her. You like that, Chuck? Once they had all fucked her, she told them to move me to a chair in the bedroom, and when they came for me, I pressed the button on the remote control for the camera in the bedroom. They carried me into the bedroom and sat me in the chair and positioned it so it looked like I was watching again, and then it got nasty. For the next two hours, all five of them were at Hillary in various combinations, and throughout it all, Hillary kept up a monologue. By the end of the second hour, I'd had more than enough. And then, like a gift from the gods, Hillary said, God, but I want you to see this so badly, Chuck. I couldn't say no to that. I stood up and said, I'm not Hillary's God, but I can grant your wish. Hillary's face turned ash gray, and I didn't even bother to look at my so-called friends. I said to the room as a whole, you all just keep having fun. I'm going to the office and start the paperwork to fire the five soon-to-be ex-employees and one soon-to-be ex-wife. And I left the room. About five minutes later, I started hearing the front door open and close. Twenty minutes later, Hillary entered the office dressed in an old terry cloth robe. She sat down on the leather couch and watched me work on the computer. I ignored her, and after about five minutes, she said, You're not really going to divorce me, are you? Of course I'm going to. It would be a lot cheaper if you didn't. If you divorce me, I'll have to hire a lawyer, and I'll end up taking you out. No divorce, no lawyer, so it won't cost you anything. Why do you want to stay? Because I love you. Yes, you do. It became very clear to me tonight. You just don't understand what you're seeing. What's not to understand? You spent four hours partying with five of my so-called friends, all the while humiliating and ridiculing me. So what? What do you mean? So what? I didn't mean a single word of it, and you should know that. By now you must have realized it wasn't the first time. Watching any of your other poker games, did you notice any coldness, any lack of affection? No, you haven't. But I do try to cheat on you every chance I get. I love you, Chuck, but I need more sex than two or three men can provide. I found that talking the way I did tonight turns men on, and they stick around longer. When you go out of town... I always have one or two men to keep me busy, and they usually do me when I'm on the phone with you, but it's not out of disrespect to you, Chuck. It's just something that turns them on. That's all it is, Chuck. Sex. Not love. Just sex. I love you, and I don't care about any of them. It doesn't change anything, Hillary. I'm old-fashioned about some things, and one of them is that my wife belongs to me, and once she's no longer mine, she's gone. Don't do it, baby. I'm not leaving quietly. Even if you don't let them, they'll still want to, and I can get them to back me up in court. 
It'll be six of us against one, and we'll all swear you were drunk out of your mind and imagined the whole thing. Let it be, baby. Just let it be, and let me work on you. I'm going to prove to you that I love you. You love me, but you're willing to go to court. Perjure yourself and try to make me look like a hysterical fool? That doesn't add up, Hillary. It's the only leverage I have to try to get you to drop this divorce thing. I don't want to do that, Chuck. But if I go far enough and put enough effort into it, I hope I can get you to back off. I'm sorry, Hillary, but as far as I'm concerned, you're damaged goods. Okay, baby, but don't say I didn't warn you. Okay, Hillary, you did warn me. Just be out of the house by the end of the day. While she was in the shower, I got the cameras, took them into my office, and turned them on. I had everything taped and clear enough to be able to identify all the players. I slept in the guest room and left the house at 6 in the morning for my usual Saturday morning golf date. I played 18 holes, and when I got home, Hillary was already gone. Hillary left, and I sat down and made a list of things I needed to do first thing Monday morning. I spent the rest of the weekend going through the house and packing up everything of Hillary's that I could find and moving it into the garage. I made three copies of the videotapes I had of the aftermath of the poker game and locked all the tapes in a safe in my den. Monday morning, I fired Bob, Joe, Al, Mike, and Steve and set about hiring their replacements. That same day, I called the company lawyer and asked him to recommend a good divorce attorney and met with him two days later. I told him the story, handed him the two original tapes, and told him I wanted their existence kept secret for as long as possible. I told him that Hillary had told me about how she would get all my former friends together and make them lie in court. I wanted the bastards to do it and then show them the tapes so I could see them arrested on perjury charges. Hillary did what she promised to do. She tried her best. Acting on the theory that divorce is impossible unless the papers are served, she disappeared. Six months passed, and then she called me on the phone. Have you come to your senses yet? Did you miss me? Did you finally realize that I love you and don't want a divorce? Come on, honey. We can talk this through and get it all together. I know we can. I was on the verge of hanging up when I had a brainstorm. You're right. I do miss you, but I don't see how we can get back together after what you did. That's why we need to talk, honey. Okay, Hillary, when and where? Can't I just go home? I don't know anything about this. Please, honey. Well, I don't think it can hurt to try. When? Tonight? The sooner the better. Okay, then tonight, but I'm not promising anything. I watched from the window as Hillary pulled into the driveway and got out of her car. I watched as a man got out of his car parked across the street, intercepted Hillary in the driveway in front of the house, and handed her the divorce papers. After he left, she walked up the walkway to the front porch, and I met her at the door. She waved the papers in front of me. You tricked me. That did the trick. So you're not going to talk to me? There's nothing to say that hasn't already been said. Doesn't it matter to you that I love you and don't want to divorce you? No, you said it yourself the night I caught you. You said you needed more sex than two or three men could give you and I wouldn't stay married to a whore. Do I miss you? Hell yes. But that doesn't change the fact that you cheated on me wholesale and with a bunch of assholes who were supposed to be my friends. I will never trust you again, and I can't live with someone I can't trust. If you don't pick up the divorce papers, Chuck, I will ruin you. I don't want that, but I will do whatever I have to do to stop this divorce. I'm only gonna say this once, Hillary. Go to court with these assholes and lie, and I will destroy every single one of you. So far, all it's cost them to stab you in the back is their job. If they go with you and lie, I'll make you all pay. Hillary started to say something else, but... I closed the door in front of her. Hillary hired a lawyer and the dance began. Her lawyer demanded and my lawyer objected, and it went on for a while. Neither side yielded an inch and eventually it went to court. I told my side of the story, and then Hillary and the five assholes stood up and told the story she said they would tell. The judge said it sounded like a words versus words situation, only she had a backup version and I didn't. At this point, my lawyer said we had all the documentation we needed, and he produced the tapes and some fingerprints that had been lifted from the tapes and audio from the conference room. 
The judge pulled both attorneys, Hillary and I, into his office and started kicking our asses for not getting all the trash out of the way before coming into his court. You had records, and you could have disclosed that you had them. You wouldn't have had to make this farce in my courtroom. At this point, I interrupted the judge and told him that I did not allow my attorney to disclose the information. I wanted everyone to see what lying scum Hillary and my five former friends were, and the only way to do that was to subpoena them and let them lie in front of God and everyone else and then prove they were liars. The judge called a recess. I walked out of the courtroom and made a phone call. That afternoon, a courier service delivered copies of everything I had to the wives of the five assholes, as well as Hillary's mother, father, sisters, brother, and her two living grandparents. That was three months ago, and the divorce is final. Hillary walked out of the marriage, keeping only what she brought with her, her maiden name. Steve was somehow able to save his marriage, but the other four are in divorce court, and they are nowhere near as well off as I am. I haven't heard a word from Hillary since she called me the day after our court appearance and called me every vile word she could think of. How could you stoop so low as to send this to my family? I warned you that if you lied in court, I would destroy you. You should have known me well enough to know that I would carry out my threat. You lied, and I made sure you paid for that lie. And I hung up the phone. I'm rid of her, and I guess I should be glad. But why do I keep thinking about her, and why do I feel so miserable? 